Okay, hello and welcome. Thanks for your patience. I just wanted to give um, a chance for a few more people to join us. My name's Emma, Emma Farrow, and I'm involved with the IFLA Special Interest Group, Evidence for Global and Disaster Health. This is our second webinar in the series. We had one um, before Christmas, um, and it's lovely to see so many people joining us today, some familiar faces and some new names as well. Um, so I'll be recording this session, and I'll make the recording and the transcript available together with um, Bailey's slides. If anyone is having any problems, please do send me a message on the chat box. Um, hopefully you've all discovered it now down. If you hover at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the chat option comes up. So welcome. This webinar is all about librarian first responders. Now, our special interest group was established in January 2018. So we're still fairly new, but we have had, as well as the first webinar, a session during the last IFLA Congress and a satellite meeting. And uh, Faley, who's speaking today, was one of the presenters there. She did an excellent paper, very well received. So I'm delighted that she agreed to join us today and share some more of her research. Before I hand over, I wanted to say that um, you can see down at the bottom of the screen, we have our Twitter address. So you can follow that to find out more about the group. Um, but also, please feel free if you want to send any tweets today, you're welcome. There's the link on the right hand side for more about our IFLA pages. And when I send out the recording to everyone who registered for the webinar, I'll include some information about how you might want to get involved or if you want to hear more about our work. Um, for example, we have an occasional newsletter that we send out to, um, to friends. Okay, so um, as we go through, we're going to pause from time to time to give people the opportunity to ask questions. So please, um, if, you, if you have any questions, feel free to add them to the, the chat box and we'll be monitoring that. And I'm just checking. Yeah, I think I've said everything I was going to say. So without further ado, I will hand over to Bailey and bear with us. We're just going to blank the screen while we swap the slides over. I've noticed there's a couple of queries for me in the chat box, so I'll respond to you personally now. Thank you. Um, good day, colleagues and friends worldwide. Emma, thank you very much for your introduction. It's a great honor for me to be here to greet you online and uh, to share some of uh, my research with you. My name is Philly Tukifner. I'm a faculty in the School of Library and Information Science at the University of South Carolina. Hope that you are able to see me and hear me okay. If you um, cannot hear me, and please let me know. Um, so you have already seen the titles of this webinar, Librarian First Responder. That's my belief. I always feel that librarians are first responders to people's needs. Situations vary, but librarians stand tall when their users, their community members, uh, need their support, especially in time of crisis. I started my journey in studying public librarians and public libraries value and their information services 
in time of crisis since 2015. Um, it's just because my home and my home got hit by a major flooding. I would like to introduce you my team members. Um, I have been leading several teams to conduct this research and our research still ongoing. Dr. Jing Jing Lu has been with me since 2015. Dr. Darren Freiber joined us in 2017. Dr. Elizabeth Harnett and Dr. Hazam Samir were our doctoral students and research assistants. Now they graduated and have earned their doctoral degree. Ms. Denise Lyons is with the South Carolina State Library. She, she's one of the South Carolina State Library's administrator. She was a participant in my first study. Now we are collaborating our research together. South Carolina State Library is also our uh, collaborator. Mr. Michael Corbell and Ms. April Hobbs are our current students and they are wonderful and essential team members to give us research support. Give me one minute to turn on my timer. What I plan to do is to talk about 40 to 45 minutes. And usually when I talk, I would forget about time. So it is essential for me to have that on. Now, since we have participants from worldwide, I just wanted to show you the location of our study. My home is in the state of South Carolina in the Southeast Coast, in, in the Southeast area of the United States. And we also extended our study to the state of Texas. Originally, I came from Taiwan. I'm very familiar with dealing with um, disasters, such as earthquakes and typhoon. I still remember the training programs that I attended when I was a librarian covering disaster response. In my position, I need to help our students become competent and confident professionals who can support their library services to communities in times of crisis. As library and the information science researchers, we're well positioned to investigate libraries, community development and engagement. Our journeys started almost toward the end of 2015. In 2015, several county in the central part of South Carolina experienced catastrophic flooding that caused severe damages. So we interviewed librarians, we did, fo uh, we did focus groups to study the librarian's services. I will talk about more. In 2016, almost the same day, South Carolina got hit by Hurricane Matthew uh, along the coast. And Hurricane Matthew caused both wind and water damage. So 
In, uh, so afterward, we studied community members' information needs and access. I think some of you still remember Hurricane Harvey stole, stop, set in Texas for several days. Harvey hit Houston, Texas um, on August, started August 25th through September 1st in 2017. The damages created beyond description. This disaster provided a, such a platform in the, to help us investigate public libraries' values to their community and their legitimacy as partners of multi-level agencies from different sectors. These are the damages created by these three severe events. You can see the devastated damages created. Many community members were impacted. My intention is to examine and document the dynamic phenomenon related to public libraries and their social responsibilities in time of disaster. This is an outline of my talk today. I will talk about how to design and conduct a situation-specific research study and share some finding with you. Of course, I cannot share everything we, uh, we have learned, but my focus will be on the discussion of public librarians' collaboration and with health sciences librarian and other professionals uh, from different sectors. I, I will also talk about what we found related to technology access, including the social media access. Of course, in my position, I really care about uh, knowing the professional librarians required knowledge and the skills and the competencies. So I am able to integrate them into my teaching. So here are the three studies we have uh, done, but one is still ongoing, that's the third one. Situation-specific case research is a type of research can help us um, investigate one case or a specific situation in depth. The methodology consists of both qualitative and quantitative approaches. We use the focus groups, interview and survey. We use all of them. Information was collected regarding the librarian's activity, each library's partnership with other agency and community members' information needs and use of technology, including social media. But one thing, and I have to say that we just finished the data collection at the end of Last year, we traveled to Houston. We conducted focus group uh, meetings over there. So we're still in the data analysis period of time. But it doesn't matter. 
we will be able to share some preliminary results with you. For these three studies, the research protocols was designed by Dr. Jingjing Lu, Dr. Freiber, Dr. Darren Freiber, and me. I was the one who wanted to use uh, these public health framework. I have been working with public health professionals and educators for years. I'm one of the academic advisors of our university's certificate of graduate study in health communication. It's an interdisciplinary certificate of study program joint administered by the USC's Arnold School of Public Health and College of Information and Communications. Our school is under the College of Information and Communications. Many public health professionals, at least many of them that I know, don't understand that public libraries have been closely connected with diverse populations in local community. I sincerely believe in public libraries value. I believe that public libraries are legitimate partners of public health agencies and the multi-level government agencies. However, if I wanted to help my colleagues to understand my belief, I needed to use the framework that they understand, they accept to design research projects. However, I have to say that, and I do have some um, mixed feeling about the use of these framework and the guidelines. I think that they are not the most appropriate ones for information professionals to use. And I hope one day our teams will be able to use research findings to develop framework and the guideline that can easily um, be used by librarians through uh, used by librarians and information professionals. So I'm going to pause for a little bit. It's just because perhaps you know any framework and a guideline that we can use. So please share your uh, comments and questions with us. So I would like to pause for a couple of minutes. A little bit. So please feel free to share your uh, comments with us. Thanks, Bailey. Um, if anyone would like to put messages into the chat box, or I can unmute you if you'd like to speak. Okay, shall we continue? Okay. Bailey, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, I muted you. Ah, hang on. Sorry about that. So everybody, okay, you can hear us now. Sorry about that. I was just going to say, Faley, that you have a message 
Ah, okay. From Denise in the chat box saying about the health department using the librarian's bulletin board to spread concerns about our uptake in TB incidents. I think that's a very important one thing, and I have to make an and a comment on that. It's very in, uh, interesting. The first time, um, after we fin so here is, so I will tell you the story when we talked about, uh, a, well, along with the next slide. Okay, we started our study in, ab, ab, almost around December 2015, we got hit by flooding. Completely, just, it's an awful experience. At that point of time, okay, my house, what the first pictures that I saw, my house almost got flooded. I still remember my husband peek outside every five minutes. It's just because at that point of time, our house has, has a little creek in the backyard. He, he peeked outside every five minutes. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, we will get a flood. Oh, in my mind was, and I did not say that to him, we'll just get all of us, all of us worked up. So, I was just start to take my mental notes. Okay, I'm I'm gonna check CDC. What if we we got a flooding? Well, it's very fortunate we did not lose power. We had internet on all the time. So okay, do we need to file FEMA? Da 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 da. So after we finally we did not get hit but the entire city pre pretty much broke down. We could not even go out to get food. It's just because when the road got cut down. That was the first thing came to my mind. I'm one of the community member. In my most anxious moment, the first thing that I want is to be able to find credible information that can help me cope with the disaster. That's why the first thing that I wanted to do is to find out the public librarians partnership and their operations. It's just because the majority of the local public librarians are our graduate. I really wanted to know how well of it, yes, I do have com, uh, confidence to, to our students, but I still wanted to know how well they responded, okay? How well they responded um, to this event. That's why we, we designed this study. And at that point of time, we were supposed to do focus group study with librarian. We wanted to at least interview FEMA agent. We also wanted to interview community members. However, so in the at the end of 15, we conducted the three focus group meetings. We uh, we talked to 25, uh, uh, tw uh, 25 library directors, administrators, and librarians. All of them are professional librarians except the one. It just, it's just because his work is related, was related to facility management. So, we just trying to identify the public librarian's services. And after three months effort, we finally got approval 
to interview a FEMA agent. Um, we work with local public library system, that's Richland Library. At that point of time, FEMA stationed at Richland Library's main library and branches to end as a disaster recovery center. So usually FEMA agents were not allowed to be interviewed. Okay, so we were, um, so we were able to get the permission after there are some procedures to follow. We finally uh, got to talk to a FEMA agents in 2016. At that point of time, we simply could not interview the community members because every time I tried to talk, talk to a computer a community member, he or she broke down. The damage was so severe. The emotional trauma was so severe. They simply could not talk anything about that event. So we understand that's the reason we designed the second study. We learned the lesson. I know we cannot do the interview. So after and we started to 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 talk about how to investigate community members information access. So we tried, we tried and thought about these and then we designed a survey and a survey questioning. It's just one step at that point of time. Then who knew Hurricane Matthew hit the coastal area? Almost the same day is like a deja vu nightmare came, uh, came back. So we revised a little bit and tweaked some questions of our questioning, make it to three sets. Why? Just because in 2015, um, the flood hit the central park. The 16th hurricane Matthew hit the coastal area, but there is a one county tuck in the middle got hit twice. They got flooded back to back. Goodness, it is so hard. It is so hard. And just by thinking about the damages. So we sent out the questions here in 2017. But at that point of time, we were only allowed to distribute, okay, to distribute the questionnaire to, to her library card hold members and buy, uh, no, we only allowed to post our survey on the library's website and to put some printed copies in the libraries. We're not allowed to access any like car holders information and contact them. No, we're not allowed. It's about the privacy issue. So I just want you to give, an, and I just wanted to give you a background of this study, but at least we found something very interesting about the information access. And I would like to share something with you and actually echoed what we found from the first group interview in our first study well. Okay. So the next is Harvey. After we had ex have had experience for two study, we wanted to expand the scope. And I still remember the Hurricane Harvey um, 
hit Texas. And at that point of time, Dr. Jin Jin Lu, one of our team, team members, had moved to Texas in the Houston. And I still remember we exchanged email and texts with her every day. Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Are you okay? So that's the reason we decided let's bring our study to Houston. We particularly wanted to study uh, Houston public libraries services just because Houston Public Library is so large okay it's almost uh, I think they have over 20 branches okay that is also one of the most diverse community it's the fourth largest the city in the United States. I think as, as we, from our study, they have almost 90 people in the community uh, speaks almost 90 different languages. It is actually a fascinating census data to us. So we brought our study to Houston. Our team held a five focus group meeting in Houston Public Library's main library. We talked to over 50 participants, and some of them are professional librarians, and some of them are staff members who do not have MLIS degree. <laughs> We're still working on the data analysis. So let me share some of our fine uh, Finding with you. As I mentioned earlier, I truly believe that. Truly believe in public libraries value and their legitimacy and as partners of public health agencies and collaborators with multiple organizations. Yes, they are. Based on our research finding, Um, earlier, I mentioned that FEMA agent stationed at Richland Library's main and branches um, as Disaster Recovery Center. At that point of time, U.S. Congressman James Clayborn, yes, he's from South Carolina, and the state uh, senator, Joel Lurie, helped reach the libraries to get um, FEMA station name. Librarians were able to help a lot of users fill out the online claim form. FEMA's form is one of the most difficult documents for community members to understand. A lot of community members did not uh, have personal computer. Many of them use cell phone to access internet. And like FEMA's online clan form, require users to register account and send an email to confirm the user's um, account, confirm that. So a lot of community members really do not quite know. So Richland Library's 
librarian really uh, helped a lot. The FEMA agent told us that a lot of people do not even know that they were at the Richland Library. However, when people went to the libraries for, for books, items, program, they got to know, wow, FEMA agents are, are here. So they were able to work with the FEMA agent. So, and also the Richland libraries took uh, toys, uh, uh, books to shelters. In fact, the 14% of all FEMA applications in 2015 flooding associated uh, with 2015's flooding were filed at Richland's main library and the branch libraries. To me, that is amazing. Um, the librarians told me that they brought laptop computers to shelters, but they were no um, internet. That's the different things done by the librarian in Houston. Librarians in Houston took laptop computer and the hot spots to shelters, and that worked. And I and and I know that hot stop and hot spots were donated by one of the um, cell phone vendors. I do not quite know the names. I'm not so sure, so I don't want to give you the wrong information. But they did that. Georgetown County Library actually won the. Um, was awarded in January 2011 as one of the nine National Public Library Innovation Awards by the International City and the County Management Association. Four to five of Georgetown County's librarians were, were well trained uh, to work with the Georgetown, okay, yeah, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I am reading some of the posting, okay, sorry about that. So, the, the, um, these librarians serve regularly in the Georgetown uh, County Emergency Operations Center. Okay, in, in the center's public information officers section in the communications center. In the, so Georgetown Public Library is a part of the Georgetown's emergency center, they just, it's pretty much an integrated part of the system. Houston is the same. They were a part of the city's system. The city of Houston has, has a very comprehensive system for emergency preparedness, response, and re, uh, and re uh, and recovery. In our study in 2017, we uh, we covered the survey of Georgetown County Public Libraries, and of course we have a lot of uh, friends and uh, colleagues over there. So they were able to to uh, tell us that in one of their branches, that's Johns Island. Regional Library was open to serve as a satellite and an administrative officer for the local fire department. Okay, the fire department's headquarters building was in 
was without internet access. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Georgetown County Libraries Tech glitches. Glitches. Later, uh, when when we talked about technology, as I mentioned to you, Houston Public Libraries um, served the fourth largest cities in the United States. Okay, over 90 languages are spoken in the area. And Houston is one of the most uh, racially and, and ethnically diverse city in the United States. They have over 20 um, branches. Houston Public Library is a part of the city of Houston centralized system. They are well prepared and they had been through several disasters. Okay, great. Disasters like some of you, particularly from United States, remember Hurricane Rita, Ike, Tropical Storm Allison, and it just, they have been through this. So they are they are well prepared okay they have a very comprehensive plan issued by the city and all the city employees have the different tiers so when the disaster hit the city they needed to um they needed to be on duty so they have they they are they uh, their external partners, including the Department of Housing, uh, Public Health. Um, they work with other libraries extensively. Two of their branches serve as shelters. They took laptop and the hotspot to the shelters at the convention center after, um, after Harvey hit um, Houston. They also opened a very interesting program that's called Camp Houston. They serve as daycare for two, for the children of 21 departments, city employee. They serve, uh, they had story time activities, Legos, puppet, and a lot of things. So the city uh, employees were able to concentrate on their recovery activities. So, Okay, yeah, okay, great. The Shibon uh, share a very good source and please see that. And now, Houston Public Library and still have two branch libraries, okay, opened in city's public health department's building. It is because they are well connected with the public health department of the city. So the city opened the door. You need a temporary location. We have the places for you. Uh, they have a simple shelving. They have the, uh, they have the uh, um, computer lab. And they actually brought food and some of the things to share with the community member. Now, here's another interesting thing that I learned at that trip. We talked about interviewing in some of the ways we have been using for data collection. At that point of the time, 
even the Houston Public Library's librarians told us that they were pleased that we waited a year to visit Houston. It's just because even though after one year, they still feel very emotional to, to have talked about the situation. This was a very humbling learning experience to me and my team members. We learned a whole lot. I probably can write a textbook to document these and these events and how wonderful that public librarians did in Houston and in other places. However, here is something I did not define and, and I did not hear a lot. Majority of the learn and, and of them, them did not share a lot of health information resources. Most of them did not mention that they share resources in multiple languages, just English and Spanish. So, I wanted to show you a wonderful resource, and I would like to pause for a couple of minutes, and then, and I know that my colleagues with National Library of Medicine and, and, and LMs are here with us, and I think that they may know more about the resources that I really would like to, to share with you. So I would like to deem my microphone for the time being to the, give the podium to my microphone to my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, Faley, thank you so much for your presentation. This is Siobhan Champ Blackwell. I work at the National Library of Medicine and um, we're very fascinated to learn about the research you're doing and thank you for this presentation. Um, this is an example of a web page from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, which uh, Valley was talking about, uh, that she got funded um, uh, by them to do a project. So the, 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 we call them the regional medical libraries. You can find out if you're from the United States who your regional medical library is and what kind of funding they have. But we do really try to help librarians and uh, the professional workforce understand the role of information and how collaborations can happen so that the things you're talking about, the sharing of health information, the sharing of information online can um, occur. And um, I'll put in the chat box, we have a training program, uh, all online, all free, where you can get training um, on the basics of disaster health information. And the, we have a course in international context. Uh, we're in the middle of updating them all, but um, um, I've been sharing. Oh, thank you, Val. I've put the link in there in the chat box for me. Um, I've been sharing resources as you've been going along, self-serving, all of trying to get people to come to our website. So thank you for that opportunity. I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Let's, let me show you another thing that I found from this website. If you, and, and uh, pl please correct me if I am wrong, and I think that th this is a wonderful interactive tool that you can use. If you don't have any experience in creating a disasters plan, please consider using these online tools. And this is a very useful tool. As I know, uh, several colleagues of mine have done that, okay? So please remember these, this is a wonderful source. Am I correct or anything to add on? Oh, that's true. This is a very wonderful source. And um, it's, we always say that it doesn't matter all the things you know, if your library isn't ready to respond, then if you don't have your own plan, if you have to have your personal plan, your institutional plan, and then you can get involved. So yes, very important. Okay. Next, let's talk a little bit about technology. 
Um, in, in 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. At that point of time, um, I know that very well, that internet was not widely used, but not this time. Internet, website, social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Flickr, in, uh, Instagrams, have all been used. Our research results show that technology access was very crucial to obtain credible information and disseminating resources and services to the community. The internet was predominantly used by both librarians and community members. Librarians, okay, in, in the 2015 study, Richland's libraries, librarian even used social media sites to answer communities' members' questions at home. It's just because the main libraries and, uh, and other branches were closed. It's just because at that point of the time, there, there was no water. Electricity was okay, and the internet was a little bit on and off, but there was no water. Okay, so that was the reason Richland libraries closed. However, in, in Houston, it's different, okay? All the messages were sent by the centralized system from the city government. So librarians don't do, don't do that. However, the librarians were able to use the library's website to provide the updated information. Well, I needed to watch over my time a little bit. Um, all right, now, I mentioned about Georgetown County Public Library earlier, but there was a very unfortunate thing that happened at that point of the time. The director of Georgetown County Library is a friend of mine, Dwayne, uh, Dwight McInville. The, and I would like to read uh, something he said to me. So it's a quote. Unfortunately, a specific outcome of Hurricane Matthew crippled the Georgetown County Library system. A key fiber optic line that served the county emergency operation centers, county law enforcement, and the judicial center was severed during the height of Hurricane Matthew. The fiber optic line went to those three vital agencies through a physical access point at, a, at the headquarters of library in Georgetown. It was obvious that, that this connectivity would need to be restored immediately. So the public library systems gave up its own connectivity, which was completely undamaged, so that the emergency, the county emergency center, um, the sheriff department and judicial center could have it. We were given the expectation that the time that fiber optic line would be restored in a couple of weeks, but the actual restoration time was months afterward. Due to lack of needed fiber on the US market. Sad, isn't it? How that remind me of something. When earthquake hit, hit, uh, hit Haiti, cell phone was the most important device. When tsunami and earthquake hit Japan, 
everything got wiped out. E, uh, even the cell phone tower. So the only thing working at that point of time in certain area is satellite. I cannot say that. Do we need it to, to, to consider making huge investment to have more advanced technologies in in the uh, in the library, I, I cannot say that. It's just because each library has different budget issue. But I do believe that library systems should have comprehensive disaster technology plans too. That's Personally, I believe that. Okay, just my personal uh, thoughts. So here is some res here are some results, and I would like to share them with you related to the community members' internet access. You can see that um, you can see that the Facebook is widely used. And Shibon is right, radio, TV, and it's just because South Carolina was very lucky. And even though the, uh, the uh, uh, electricity was on and off, but overall, um, TV was also um, in a source to get information. Now, we do not have a lot of time, so that's continue, and we will do Q and A more. That's our concern. Please see this quote. Uh, that's our concern. Please see this quote from the FEMA agent. Information and technology literacy problems created the barriers for many community members in accessing disaster health information, especially FEMA applications and the filing claim forms. In 2015, Richland libraries, librarians play key roles in setting up the temporary center in their library so they are so they so they were able to work with FEMA agents to me that's wonderful things okay now let's think let's take a look at these that you know in our survey well in 2015 we talked to librarians none of them meant uh, mentioned a lot of things about health information resources. None of them mentioned much. This is our survey in 2017. The majority of the survey participants said, said that it's easy, it's very easy to access credible information However, a, a lot of them admitted that they did not use any information at all. So they didn't, they, some of them know, at least knew CDC, Mellon Plus, and the, the South Carolina Public Health department's website. Some, some, uh, some of them just said, we did not need to use any resources. So here is my worry. My worry is that our community members may not know what they don't, don't know. And we researchers, librarians must consider, okay, must consider 
how to create the training programs, the literacy training programs for community members. So, and even in our 2015 study, and even public librarians admit that they were not fully prepared to, to access and provide essential health information for adult users online. They not have a website. Now they do have some, but not but not all of them. Of course, Houston, they they have a, a website on, but they did not have a lot of those kind of like online tutorial or those training programs. No. So here's what I hope that. I wanted to say these to my colleague in health information community. I sincerely hope that we can work together, public librarians and the health sciences librarian should not work as silos. We can work together. Health sciences librarians can train public librarians on accessing this essential information. And I know that NLM has already started to have the Consumer Health Symposium training programs uh, for public library. This is wonderful. But still, we, we do need to have some training programs for the general public. Perhaps can have those kind of short tutorials uh, posted on a specific website. That website has selected credible resources in multiple languages, okay, that can serve the, the community members' needs anytime, anywhere. Health sciences librarian, uh, librarians can work with public librarians to deliver some real-time information services delivered via online platform, such as social media sites. This is, I think, this is a win-win situation to both in. Okay, we're approaching to the end. This is the website created by Houston Public Library. Okay, at the end, I wanted to talk about the required knowledge and skills and the competencies. These are what we learned from our, from our studies. Still the most important things are change management and leadership skills. Librarians, needed to be able to serve as first responders. They needed to stand tall and bring a new normal to the community. There is no way, because I have been through this personally, after a disaster hit, there is no way we can return to the way we were. We all needed to accept there, there would be a new normal. And librarians as first responders need, needed to be able to do change management and help community members understand that changes must come. We all needed to be able to deal with these changes. Librarians needed to be able to work with professionals from other sectors. They needed to be politically savvy, be eagerly in, uh, involved in community in, uh, engagement. They needed to know e uh, emergency management, crisis community, they needed to create te uh, technology policies, 
well used technologies understand the resources, especially health and the government resources available. The saddest part for my study is in the 2015, none of the members said that they wanted to have this, particularly the crisis management parts in the regular LIS courses. Well, I, well, I am doing that anyway. But they would accept the continuing education pro, uh, program. That's why, and I think that resources like NLM's resources, the training program uh, pro, uh, provided by NLM are so essential, okay? I would like to stop over here, and I hope that Siobhan can, can tell us a little bit more about this pro, uh, program. And then I, I just got to know this wonderful resource, this training workbook. But first, please tell us more about these training courses, Siobhan. Yeah, thank you again, Faley. Um, so we worked with the Medical Library Association, um, and we um, we used the the pilot that they had already done on the consumer health information specialization. So we created these. We we actually had uh, experts outside of. Uh, we didn't create the courses. We ha had other librarians and experts in the field create these courses to. Um, to help librarians understand what their roles could be. Um, you talked about how, how FEMA shows up at a library. I mean, they just show up or they don't show up, but the library still has, you know, that people come into the library and say, I have to fill out this form and I don't have computer access at home. Um, or you have a more, a larger homeless population. So libraries, especially public libraries, they don't have a choice. And so, um, we created these courses um, and you can take them all online if you want to you can and you're a member of Medical Libraries Association or not it doesn't matter you can um, apply to the Medical Library Association after you've done the three basic courses and then um, added in six credit hours of another course of other courses and get the specialization and um, we we have people from outside libraries, from public health departments, emergency managers, who all get this specialization, which I think works both ways. It's helping, we did it to help librarians, but what we find is people in these outside professional, of the professional workforce, they need the information. That's what, we have such a great skill set, helping people find information around disasters is crucial. That's what decision making is based on. Um, it's based on the decision that the person who's making the decision has at the time. And we want them to find credible, reliable information. And we have the skill set to do it as librarians. So that's what this is all about. Um, so yeah, I recommend it. You don't have to, you don't have to pay anything for the courses. Thank you. Um, do you want me to talk about the New Jersey library one? Okay. So after Hurricane Sandy hit the state of New Jersey, um, Michelle Stricker, who is, uh, I forget her position at the New Jersey State Library, she went, she went all gung-ho and created, they had workshops, they met with the librarians, she created this um, disaster planning and uh, community resilience guidebook for the libraries in the state. And what was great about it is that many of the libraries, because they're public libraries, they already were, had kind of that seat at the table with the emergency managers already. And so um, they, they met monthly already. Now what they could say is, oh, now we recognize that libraries have a role. How can we work with these public um, entities like the fire department, police, hospitals, and have them understand 
that we have a role and have ourselves understand our role. So this is an excellent um, toolkit. And Michelle Stricker was just recognized by Library Journal as a mover and shaker this year for her role in getting this uh, workbook in all of the workshops that the New Jersey State Library has done in the past. So it's, I think it's a very exciting tool and really glad to see it. Um, we are pretty much at the end of this program. So our journey continues. We still haven't finished our study. Um, hopefully our, our teams will, uh, uh, will to travel to different lo uh, locations from our one to study and document the phenomenon, the dynamic phenomenon on public library services in time of crisis. So I would like to stop over here. Questions and comments? Haley, I'd like to thank you for such an illuminating talk. I've learned a huge amount from listening to you and also from following all the contributions from others. So thanks to Siobhan and colleagues as well who have posted links. And I'm thinking, um, I mentioned at the beginning about this um, newsletter, our occasional newsletter from the group. I think it would be very nice to do a Q&A session with you. So I appreciate that we've We've got a, a little bit over time now, but if people have any questions now or later and you want to get in touch, we could respond to those in the newsletter. And I know that uh, you may want to uh, stop the session now. Well, if you have any comments and a question, feel free to email me. And Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share our research journey with you, and thank you.